everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to the first uh, UPSA and Air, uh, joint UPSA and Ernica webinar. Uh, it's on a very controversial topic, which is in fact very close to my heart, which is about neck diagnostic and therapeutic challenges. And we have uh, two excellent speakers, but before uh, introducing them uh, together with me today, we have uh, Mikko Pakarinen, who doesn't need any introduction, uh, is uh, the Chief of Pediatric Surgery in uh, Helsinki in Finland, uh, and the uh, editor uh, for uh, Europe for the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. Um, we uh, are going to have two speakers, uh, Jan Hulscher from uh, Groningen, the Netherlands, uh, uh, and then Antti uh, Koivusalo from uh, uh, Helsinki. Uh, so we'll start with Jan. Jan, uh, uh, as I said, is uh, from Groningen. He will uh, uh, tell us about the uh, Groningen experience. Uh, he's a con consultant pediatric surgeon and a professor of pediatric surgery uh, in uh, uh, Groningen uh, in, in uh, the Netherlands. And in fact, also the president of the Dutch uh, Pediatric Surgical Association. Um, he uh, studied medicine and philosophy at the Free University of uh, Amsterdam. Uh, we also completed uh, um, his uh, uh, residency before starting a PhD. So he's in both MD and PhD that he completed in 2002, so almost 20 years ago, um, uh, with honors. Uh, he then started uh, training as a general surgeon uh, in uh, Amsterdam, uh, completed his training in 2006, and uh, worked as a fellow in Groningen, where, when, uh, where then eventually um, uh, got a consultant position uh, as a pediatric surgeon in 2009. And uh, um, Jan is very active with uh, um, Ernica and uh, has been very active, especially on the topic of uh, uh, necrotizing and trochlitis. So we are, without further ado, we are all uh, eager to hear about uh, the uh, Groningen experience. So Jan, please. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great honor. Um, this is where we are at. Um, we're a small city in the northern part of uh, the country, the northern cowlands, as somebody called it. Um, we've got some 24 uh, neonatal intensive care uh, unit beds, and uh, we there admit some 600 cases annually. Um, 20 of those will develop NEC and some 10 will need surgery somewhere along the way. Necrotizing enterocolitis has been a, um, well, let's call it a hobby of mine and perhaps even the reason why I became a pediatric surgeon. I already spoke a little bit about the risk factors and the enigmatic disease that NEC still is. And despite all efforts, we still have a high morbidity and mortality. Um, so this was where I was. Um, I mentioned a few clinical issues. Can we predict NEC? Can we predict complicated NEC? And uh, perhaps for us as surgeons, just as important, when should we intervene surgically and when not? And why would this be important? Um, early recognition might lead to early treatment and less severe disease. And please note the question mark. Um, early detection of high-risk groups could lead to prevent the strategies. Again, please note question mark. And all these studies. Um, this is a slide I, um, and at the left side, it depicts the healthy um, intestine with the villi, the enterocytes, the uh, tight junctions in between them, goblet cells, panet cells, and even some normal protective uh, bacteria. On the right, there's the NEC bowel. Um, the enterocytes are inflamed, the tight junctions uh, have loosened, there are bacteria that shouldn't be there, and there is the problem with um, perfusion. And when we take that into account, um, we can kind of categorize possible um, predictive and diagnostic markers. When we look at enterocyte damage, we can look, for instance, to intestinal fatty acid binding protein. 
when we look to inflammation in the immune system, we can look to fecal calprotectin. Perfusion can be measured using near infrared spectroscopy. And of course, we can look into the fetuses to assess bacterial colonization. We probably are all familiar with uh, fecal calprotectin. It's a marker for gut wall inflammation, which is routinely used in IBD, it's non-invasive. And there have been some studies suggesting that it's a good marker for NEC in the acute stadium. However, these are only few studies with single measurements. So the use of fecal calprotectin in consecutive studies um, prior to NEC remains unknown. And the same holds true for intestinal uh, fatty acid binding protein. This is a very small protein, which is located at the tips of the villi, uh, mostly it's a small bowel, and it's almost immediately released into the systemic circulation when the villi are damaged. And the villi uh, are supposedly the first to be affected in NEC if they're most distally um, when seen from a vascular point of view. Within minutes, IFAPs can be detected in urine. And therefore, this is again a non-invasive marker for which commercial ELISAs are available. We've shown before that it's a good marker uh, to distinguish uncomplicated from complicated NEC. But as yet, there was little data, again, on the consecutive measurements to predict uh, NEC, so prior to symptoms. Um, to me, near-infrared spectroscopy is always a bit of science, uh, science fiction. Um, it measures tissue oxygenation via uh, spectroscopy uh, using the ratio between oxygenated and total hemoglobin. Um, it's multi site it can be used uh, on uh, several points of the body, for instance, uh, on the uh, cerebrum as well as the abdomen, and it's continuous and it's non-invasive. In our hospital, it's routine care uh, for all uh, neonates admitted to our uh, NICU. Regional tissue oxygen, transcutaneous arterial oxygen saturation. The third term I'd like to introduce here is what's called the fractional tissue oxygen extraction, or the FDOE. And that's the result of um, the uh, transcutaneous oxygen saturation minus the regional oxygen saturation. Um, and it's therefore important to know um, oxygen saturation will decrease. And, that, and this is important to realize when we see the graphs later on. So when we come to the results of uh, a larger um, prospective study we've performed a few years ago in high-risk neonates um, for NEC, um, we measured at several time points before uh, the disease, as of birth, before the disease, um, among other fecal calprotectin and, and uh, IFAP. Um, this slide shows the uh, results of the uh, fecal calprotectin. Um, these are the NEC cases, uh, some 10 uh, NEC cases matched uh, to controls, uh, similar gestational age, similar birth weight. And as you can see, there is no difference whatsoever between cases and controls prior to the clinical suspicion of NEC. Um, and then we hope that in the individual patient, we might see a rise in fecal calprotectin. But on the right hand of the slide, you can see that this is totally is going all over the place. There is no system whatsoever. So we have to uh, conclude that fecal calprotectin might not be a good marker for predicting NEC due to the large inter and intra individual variation. And the same story holds true for IFAB. In the, sim the similar cohort, um, you see that there is no difference in IFAB uh, between cases and controls after birth. And this is prior to clinical suspicion, again, there is until 24 hours prior to the first symptom, there are no differences between cases and controls and only 
after suspicion marker to detect uh, the development of NHC prior to symptoms. Um, again, there's a wide variation, which is most prominent in the most mature infants, most premature infants. Um, and while we can discard it, as far as I'm concerned, for screening for NEC, but it might still be a good marker for advanced disease. Um, but there is a little bit of hope. Um, these are the results of the near-infrared spectroscopy, and then something remarkable uh, appears. And I put it in red, because in children who develop NEC, the cerebral uh, oxygen saturation is lower in the first measurements, that is almost right after birth, when compared to children who do not develop NEC. And this is quite a large odds ratio. In other words, apparently there is some sort of systemic event not yet uh, identified um, that leads to a decreased cerebral oxygenation in children who later go on to develop NEC. And also, a few, hour, a few days actually prior to um, development of symptoms, there is a higher intestinal um, FDOE, again suggesting a decreased um, perfusion of the bowel. And this is already visible two days prior to NEC onset. And to me, this is the most, well, perhaps the most stunning finding we've done over the past years. This is the intestinal saturation prior to surgery. These These are non-survivors. All children with an SO2, and this is the number of survivors, with an SO2 below 53%. In other words, it might be possible to use NIRS um, as a predictor for survival after surgery. This is a small case series. This is 11 cases versus 11 controls. Yet this difference is highly significant. And if we could confirm this in a larger finding, we might actually have something to guide us in counseling parents towards the choice to go to the theater or to redirect to comfort care. So when we use NIRS, and to summarize this after birth, suggest a high risk for NEC. Intestinal um, SO2 changes only a few hours or days prior to onset of symptoms. And in surgical cases, preoperative intestinal SO2 seems predictive of survival. The good thing about having continuous NIRS um, on your babies is that you sometimes find something you weren't actually looking for. This is what happens after feeding. These are the, in gray, our preprandial pre uh, nearest measurements, 10 minutes postprandial, 30 minutes postprandial. And these are postnatal days. And as you can see, in the early beginning, there is no change whatsoever after feeding. In other words, the child cannot, or the intestine, cannot meet the metabolic demands. Only after a few weeks, you can see the necessary rise in SO2 after feeding. This is also something remarkable. And then to end a few slides about the microbiota. The, on the right side, you might see the adult gut, and this might be the premature gut. In the same study, um, we checked the fecal 
we used several time points. Iconium, the second last sample prior to NEC and the last sample prior to NEC. And I'm not a microbiologist, but I don't need to be a, micro to be a microbiologist to see that this is completely different from this. And this is the meconium. So obviously in, already in the meconium, there is an NEC associated microbiota. And when we look more closely to that, um, Clostridium and Bacteroides are especially associated with NEC development in the uh, meconium. Well, in the post meconium samples, there is an abundant staphylococci who are protective against NEC. And early feeding with mother's milk is associated with colonization with staphylococci. So there might be one of the connections between mother's milk and the protective effect it might have. I'll skip this for time. Um, a final word on pennet cells, which are very important on, for immunological defense. We hypothesize that in the premature gut, there might not be pennet cells. And if they were, they might not be immune competent. And when we looked at archival uh, specimens, we found that the net cells do arise and become immune competent only around the 30th week of gestation. And let that be the time when NEC occurs mainly. In other words, do we need the net cells for NEC to develop? And could it be that the development uh, of these cells is necessary for NEC to develop. So to conclude, predicting NEC is still virtually impossible using clinically available markers, and it's still mainly an acute disease. Of course, there are higher risk children. They might have different microbiota. There might be this systemic event around birth. They might not meet their metabolic demand and there is immunological immature, immaturity. I mentioned uh, PNET cells, but the same holds true, for instance, for TLF. And for, while not necessarily um, very hopeful for our daily practice, perhaps with the exception of NIRS, these studies do give insight in the pathophysiology of NEC. And these are the people who did all the work and who I'd like to thank. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jan. This was uh, great, great data and uh, very elegantly uh, presented. I give the mic to, to Miko. Thank you very much, Augusto. And before I introduce Auntie Koibus, I would like to also thank Jan for a very nice presentation and, and also welcome you all also on my behalf. So our next speaker is uh, uh, Assistant Professor Antti Koivusala from Helsinki. He's, uh, uh, in addition of being pediatric surgeon, he has full training in, in adult gastrointestinal surgery and general surgery. And he was trained here in Helsinki, spent one year in, in Holland, in Utrecht, uh, doing neonatal and, and endoscopic surgery at that time. And Antti has done, uh, first of all, he has treated these patients for almost uh, 30 years and has done pretty much of a clinical uh, work and, and studies of patients in NEC. And today he's going to share his experience with clinical challenges of treating and, re and reaching good outcomes in this patient population. Please, Antti. So uh, the long-term outcome of these patients is uh, a, lot, a lot of their um, relation to their prematurity. However, there are things that uh, necrotizing enterocolitis is uh, doing for the long-term long -term outcome and usually for the worse. The main uh, points uh, are the neurodevelopmental impairment, growth, 
and on the gastrointestinal um, side, uh, a short bowel syndrome or intestinal failure, uh, cholestatic uh, liver disease, uh, dysmotility problems of the uh, uh, gut uh, adhesion obstructions, and some uh, miscellaneous uh, problems. Uh, there are some very good uh, studies uh, how the neck affects uh, neurodevelopmental impairment and uh, the risk of uh, interventricular hemorrhage, periventricular leukomalacia and white matter injury is increased in patients with uh, uh, neck. And all these are predictive of long-term uh, neurodevelopmental uh, outcome. Uh, other detrimental factors for the neurodevelopment are inflammation, hospital stay, and surgery. The majority of the outcome studies which concerns the effect of neck on neurodevelopmental outcome are from ages less than 36 months. And the detrimental effects of neck on a behavioral or educational outcome on later age is more unclear. Uh, a study made in Texas with the Medicaid uh, <clears throat> uh, had a large uh, population of patients with uh, uh, premature patients and patients with neck with them. And they uh, reported to three or four fold higher likelihood of uh, failure to thrive and growth and poor get, catch up uh, growth in uh, uh, neck uh, patients. And uh, uh, another study uh, reported that among patients with uh, short bowel, neck patients had lower uh, growth uh, or, or uh, gaining growth less than uh, should be expected of them, even after correcting for the loss of intestine, uh, correcting for gestational aid, weight, and uh, other uh, parameters. So uh, <clears throat> a Canadian, Canadian study uh, assessed the neurodevelopment and growth outcomes in neck patients, in uh, patients which were uh, most, uh, or, or with gestation age uh, less than two, 29 weeks, or many with uh, Perfor uh, spontaneous perforations, but uh, uh, a lot of patients with perforated or non-perforated uh, NAC. Uh, to have a, a NAC uh, with or without perforation or any perforation, increase the odds for death or significant uh, neurodevelopmental impairment to the fourfold compared with the neonates with prematurity, but without intestinal uh, disease. And uh, NAC alone increased odds for uh, neurodevelopmental impairment uh, 1.8 fold. Uh, necrotizing enterocolitis is also a common cause uh, of intestinal failure. Uh, there is a Helsinki material from uh, uh, Laura Mersalmia and Mikko Pakarinen uh, about uh, 100 uh, first uh, patients who uh, went through the pediatric intestinal failure program in Helsinki. And you can see that uh, 35 patients or 35% of the patients have uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, uh, so it's the largest group. Uh, to put this thing on perspective, uh, I estimated that we had in Helsinki and Tampere, which are the largest uh, NICU, uh, units in Finland, uh, we had 104 ne neck survivors from uh, 1986 to 2017. And uh, in my cal oh, sorry, calculations, uh, a radical estimate, I admit, uh, one fifth or even one, one fourth of uh, survived neck patients uh, have uh, undergone some kind of uh, management or assessment for uh, uh, 
in, uh, intestinal uh, failure. Also, uh, those patients with necrotizing enterocolitis uh, suffer from uh, liver disease. Uh, uh, as, I, uh, as I told you, a lot of patients uh, uh, suffer from uh, intestinal failure. In a recent study uh, by Christina Karila, uh, 41% of patients with uh, necrotizing enterocolitis or SIP, a spontaneous perforation, had um, uh, intestinal failure associated cholestasis during their primary treatment. Uh, and uh, uh, of these, 5% uh, 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 failed, uh, failed with the resolution of the cholestasis and died. But even then, 36% uh, of, of the patients survived with the uh, liver disease. And okay, again, there is uh, um, statistics uh, from Annika Multanen and Mikko Pakarinen, uh, uh, prediction, identification, and progression of histopathologic disease activity in children with the intestinal failure. And again, the blue uh, part of the of the uh, of this uh, uh, gr graph uh, shows that uh, how uh, many of these patients uh, are uh, uh, are uh, have the etiology of neck uh, for their liver disease, which may um, have effects on late uh, childhood many years. Uh, the children with extensive neck and uh, with extensive uh, small bowel resection or resection of uh, allocal wall uh, suffer from uh, uh, poor intestinal motility. Uh, there is an example of the patient who has been uh, operated on 2017 uh, with a very extensive neck with the, the initial amount of small bowel uh, being only 25 centimeters and, and a lot of co uh, iliocecal valve also resected. And the uh, photos on the right are from uh, 2019, uh, 2020, and still uh, the loops are um, uh, wide and the patient had uh, at that, that point undergone uh, Autologous adaptive surgery. It means the uh, enter, uh, <coughs> serial transverse uh, enteroplasty, but uh, these patients seem to be quite resistant to uh, autoadaptive surgery. Uh, there may also be um, also occur more uh, common or more simple problems just by uh, small bubble obstruction from adhesions. Uh, the patients are operated in a state of peritonitis with fecal uh, spilling and uh, many um, uh, things that cause adhesions. And uh, uh, in a recent study, we counted that uh, about 10% of uh, surgical patients, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis or spontaneous perforation, uh, suffer from uh, um, small bowel obstruction and uh, need to have an operation. Also, between 10 to 30% 30, 30 of the patients undergo um, endoscopic assessment of uh, uh, various uh, problems, uh, for example, degenocolic anastomotic ulcer, which may um, cause further operations or uh, assessments. What about uh, the general quality of life of uh, uh, patients with necrotizing enterocolitis? Of course, a lot of uh, the quality of life is, is uh, worsened by uh, the prematurity and associated factors. Uh, there is an uh, interesting study from uh, uh, Amin et R from uh, 2000, uh, 2018, and they compare the quality of life with uh, PAD, mm, quality of life 4.0 tests. And uh, it's interesting that um, all the uh, common neonatal disease, neck, uh, congenital diaphragm hernia, gastroschisis, uh, esophageal atresia, 
Hirschsprung disease and nonphilocele. Uh, patient with neck uh, score the worst uh, numbers in all uh, all measurements um, in uh, physical uh, from the left in uh, psychosocial uh, points and in total points and if you uh, can see that uh, the upper red uh, straight line uh, is normal quality of life and uh, that one under that means chronic chronic uh, illness so uh, this uh, speaks uh, not so well about the quality of life of these patients of course there was not, not that many of uh, neck patients uh, in this study, only 23, and the median age was uh, four years. However, these were uh, patients who had a not uh, intestinal failure or uh, small bowel, sh oh, sorry, sh uh, short bowel uh, syndrome. There is uh, uh, many other uh, things which are more bizarre, I uh, just uh, chose this one, uh, which uh, you, you usually don't think so much, but uh, a study by Baird at, uh, in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery 2013 showed that, um, well, in effect, uh, these uh, patients who have neck undergo uh, so much radiologic imaging that the radiation can uh, be a uh, cancer risk in later life. Well, this is one of the more bizarre uh, long-term outcomes. So what can we do for the long-term outcome? <clears throat> uh, the surgery perhaps, yes, we can do the primary anastomosis, we can do the stoma, we can uh, operate in good time, but then, then what? Uh, the quality of life uh, or outcome is not that good. Can we do something to prevent uh, that uh, the patient don't get an, uh, necrotized enterocolitis? Uh, there was a Canadian study in 2020 when they uh, made key practice changes in uh, neonatal intensive uh, care units. Uh, about central venous lines, transfusions, respiratory management, feeding, use of ox oxygen, neurologic injury preventation. And uh, uh, they um, got very good results. Uh, the, they increased the rate of, rate of patients discharged without any morbidity and the survival. But about uh, recognizing enterocolitis, the <laughs> result was a kind of anticlimax. It, uh, the, uh, in, incidence dropped only from 4.8 to 4 percent. Of course, that was statistically significant. I think the uh, big challenge is that if we see the uh, patients with neck uh, in Helsinki 1986 to 2020, we can't really see, we can't really see that uh, that what should be done. I think that the pediatricians have uh, tried all these tricks many years, very good quality of the, the management and so on, but still there are years completely without neck cases and then years when there are several, almost 10. So I don't know, uh, maybe these measures uh, have some effect, but maybe not. Well, uh, I took also one slide with this, this uh, terrorist bomb uh, explosions, which, uh, uh, which is uh, describing neck. And maybe the uh, reason will really be there that um, some uh, uh, group of, of, of um, researchers uh, uh, may invent just another uh, agent by adding this for the feeding or, or or the babies will uh, will uh, limit the extent of neck. There was a, a recent uh, paper with Co uh, at uh, and the others, and uh, they um, <clears throat> found that uh, low levels of IL thirty seven was bad and uh, increased uh, intestinal damage in mice, 
and by administration IL-37 um, that protect the bowel in mice. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for the for the presentations, both of you. There's uh, we have uh, people that are following us uh, from uh, all over the world, from the Philippines, uh, from uh, Greece, from uh, Bangladesh. Uh, so it's uh, definitely uh, we are beyond the borders of Europe. Uh, um, both of you. Uh, of course, we talked about biomarkers, especially Jan in, the, in his first presentation. There's been a lot of work uh, on uh, um, biomarkers uh, of uh, bowel damage to predict uh, the, the, the <clears throat> development of neck or to tell us about the, the, the degree and the severity of the intestinal damage. Um, it's uh, um, something that we are looking at now is we, we all more and more um, um, familiar with the concept that uh, neck is not just a disease of the intestine. Uh, it affects uh, other organs. There is this cytokine storm that uh, definitely affects also the brain. There are papers uh, uh, showing that in experimental models. Um, and what, you know, what maybe we should look at uh, is also biomarkers uh, of uh, brain damage um, in the ones that already have established neck, uh, markers that can uh, maybe help us uh, manage these babies uh, uh, medically or surgically. That if a baby has, of course, a free air, you would go to the UR or you would put a drain. Uh, but if a baby is uh, just um, um, surfing along with uh, his medical neck and uh, it's not improving. Uh, sometimes uh, looking at the other organs uh, can be helpful. It doesn't need to be the brain, it could be the lungs, it could be the liver. Do you uh, have any um, new perspective on this? Uh, on you, you talked about Nears uh, Jan and uh, that, that's a very elegant study. Um, Looking at other organs, is it something that uh, change your uh, uh, management in, in these babies? Uh, do you have it in your algorithm when uh, uh, you usually look at ultrasound scans, head ultrasound? Um, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, um, I, th I think it's, 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 it's an excellent question. Um, we don't have the measurements of other uh, organ systems uh, in our NEC treatment algorithm. We are currently looking um, into uh, gamma GT and especially alkaline phosphatase, uh, um, which also has an intestinal uh, isoform. Um, but then again, there's the word intestinal. So uh, it is alkaline phosphatase, but it's also coming from the intestine. Um, and actually one of our adult gastroenterologists came up with the idea to look at gamma GT um, because he found that um, there, there might be a link between uh, a, a race of a gamma GT and developing uh, NEC. So that's something we are, uh, well, started a very small pilot uh, retrospectively uh, to look into, but that's about all we are doing at this moment. I must admit that I strongly um, agree with your suggestion to look more into detail in uh, markers for uh, cerebral damage. Um, we do use um, the NEARS, but we cannot distinguish uh, NEC using cerebral uh, NEARS. Um, we do see that there is uh, often a lack of autoregulation uh, during surgery. Um, which might also predispose uh, to uh, long-term neurodevelopmental uh, sequelae. Um, but we do not see that during the course of NEC, but mainly during surgery itself. Um, but looking into uh, biomarkers for brain damage, I think it, it's, it's, it's an excellent suggestion. Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, if I may say something in, in between, uh, I think it's an excellent sort of a thought from Augusta, but I'd like to ask maybe, also, Jan and Augusta, is that I'm not sure. Are you using drain in in 
in your hospital and, and also in Augusta. What, what do you think, I mean, if, if there's a brain damage, so the first logical thought would be that you wanna get the deceased and inflamed bowel removed and the patient, you know, the inflammatory state is uh, cured as soon as possible. And I, I'm just thinking that if you use the drain, you don't heal the patient as rapidly. Uh, do you have any thoughts or experience how this, this relates to possible brain damage or other remote organ, organ damage? Uh, you want to go first, Augusta, or shall I? Uh, you, you, I can go for two hours. Yeah. Go first. Go first. Well, I, 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 I can be very quick. We do almost never use a drain. Because um, when the child is that severely ill, then the only thing you can do is drain. Um, the overall uh, prognosis for the child will probably be so bad that we most often then refrain from surgery and direct to palliative care. I think we've used three drains in the past 10 years or something like that. Yeah. And this, if we That's find that this, this uh, first intest logical. intestinal... Uh, disease is, is sort of a leading to brain damage and all these uh, long-term problems. Should we a little bit rethink the sort of old teaching that as, you know, sparing as possible, or should we be at times a bit more radical if, we are, if we're sure that, uh, you know, doing a little bit more resection, it's not gonna end up with long-term the PN dependence, but. On the other hand, you are healing the patient more rapidly and hopefully uh, preventing, preventing the, for example, the brain damage. So what do you say, Augusta? I totally agree with uh, both of you. I trained in the UK where, um, especially in institutions like Great Elma Street and uh, um, the, the, the drain was not uh, an option unless it was a part of the trial, really, uh, when Agostino was uh, leading the, the, the NET trial. Um, and so I came here uh, to Canada, to the cradle, to the place where actually uh, Ziggy Ein uh, came up with the idea. And the reason why, so I studied this, because of course in our faculty, the vast majority of surgeons would use a drain. So I went back to his paper. The first paper was a, a presentation he gave to APSA. Interestingly, 1977, APSA was in Acapulco, Mexico, beautiful location. And he reported that, you know, at the end of, you know very well, Miko, at the end of the um, article, there's the questions and answers. And so he very graciously said that there were two families. So the kids had necrotizing enterocolitis with perforated uh, intestine. And these families didn't want me to go to the UR. So I treated them conservatively, but instead of doing nothing, I put a drain. And this is how, uh, and this was happening in 1976 and he presented in 1977. Now, three years later, again, you can find it on JPS, he goes back to APSA and he says, uh, we now have uh, 30 or 40 uh, odd kids uh, that actually we've treated uh, with the drain and uh, um, a proportion of them actually got away without any uh, further surgery. Likely these are babies that had just a spontaneous intestinal perforation, a focal intestinal perforation. That's why they, they, they did well. And he says very clearly in those lines, he says, now I don't want you guys that you go away from this conference and you think that in Toronto, we don't operate on, uh, on these babies anymore. This is not the panacea. However, in the 80s, uh, that uh, message was taken uh, quite seriously. Babies were doing really bad, especially when we were talking about very low birth weight babies. And so um, the surgeons, you know, uh, were worried, uh, especially in the US uh, with maybe more medical legal, uh, medical legal attitude, uh, med defensive medicine in place, decided that, you know what, I just put a drain if the baby dies, dies because of uh, the disease and not because I've taken the baby to the OR. Then you know about the Larry Moss uh, trial, Agostino's trial. Both didn't reach uh, uh, um, the number of baby, babies that the trials were powered for. And so we're still left with the question. But there is uh, now uh, the trial done by uh, Mikalska that finished last year. 
and should be uh, reported soon, where in fact his primary endpoint was not just survival, but also neurodevelopmental uh, outcomes at one year or one or 18 months uh, uh, of life. Uh, so because I worked on the neck model for many years, I went uh, on and looked at these uh, brains and we reported that actually in the neck model, the brain of uh, pups with neck is def severely damaged. Um, at the same time, um, David Ackham in uh, Hopkins uh, did two be beautiful studies. They're now both published uh, uh, on science translational medicine and uh, basically showed that even babies that died of neck, so autopsy studies showed that the brain had an increased level of, uh, um, of um, activated microglia, demyelination. So also there's human data. Same uh, Peter Sangild, uh, closer to you guys in Copenhagen on his piglet model showed the same. So there are these experimental studies so far. So my focus has been uh, looking at uh, a potential biomarker for brain damage. But if, uh, from, a, from a therapeutic perspective, I totally agree with you, Miko, and with Jan, that you need to remove the, that piece of, uh, of bowel that is uh, uh, necrotic. Unfortunately, some of these babies have a very, very long segments. And these, of course, uh, would uh, result in uh, intestinal failure. Uh, as you know, and as Antti also showed us uh, uh, very well in his presentation. I am very uh, aggressive. I'm very uh, non-invasive, non non-aggressive in pediatric surgery in general. But when it comes to neck, I take them to the OR. I don't use the drain. The drain for me is useful only when the babies are unstable at a peripheral hospital, need to be transported. Uh, or in the immediate, uh, you put the drain, but then you take the baby to the OR. So this is how I do. But there are colleagues of mine that instead use the drain. And again, there is no evidence to say that one is better than the other. And I think maybe the evidence doesn't come from the intestine, but comes from the other organs, the lung, the brain that actually are affected because we leave the necrotic bowel inside the belly. Yeah. Did you want to, wanted to add something, Jan or Antti? Well, uh, I bumped in an American um, study and they uh, also pointed things that how to uh, improve the outcome in the uh, necrotizing enterocolitis in, in very small babies with, uh, with um, uh, less than one kilo on that region. And actually their one, their one finding, their <clears throat> one of their findings was that uh, by increasing the use of the drain, they could uh, improve the survival on their uh, uh, their babies. However, the, again, the improvement was very spectacular. It was uh, from uh, from uh, uh, sixty five percent survival to sixty eight. But in in those settings, it was uh, statistically uh, significant. However, they at, at least uh, uh, recommended that uh, that uh, it should be used. I have never used it. I've never seen a situation in our NICU that, that uh, we should think about the, the drain. Uh, all the, perhaps all the patients have been in, in good enough condition for the operation. So yeah. the experience is very, very limited on drains. And, and you know, I think it should be sort of pointed out that uh, the although you, you showed the intestinal failure figures within within NEC patients that although they they are uh, many of the the pediatric intestinal failure patients ha have NEC SA etiology but in the end of the day most of them if not all are able to win off PN and I I'm not I'm not sure if I recall correctly but I think that in our in, in, the, in the NEC population that we have treated from the beginning in Helsinki, are there any of them which were uh, permanently on PN dependent or very few? How Those uh, 100 patients which, which you yourself have. Uh, yeah, yeah, but many of them, they were, they yeah. were coming, they weren't all oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all, all over the country. Yeah. 
but the, I, I I don't know whether whether the weaning in neck is is uh, uh, any any worse than in other diagnoses. It's it's much better. Yeah. Because in, in all the in our material in and in different uh, uh, materials of other people, it's it's always the same finding that those patients who have etiologies and you see they are much more likely to win off PN. So, you know, like I, I want to again say that I, I'm not suggesting that you should do two radical resections, but the resections in my point of view should be radical enough to, to cure, cure the patient. And, and maybe because the things have changed in, in 10, 20 years, the outlook of intestinal failure is much different altogether than it used to be. So maybe at least for a bit older people, there might be a sort of a, we, we need to change a little bit the, the way we look at these things. So another, I think another very controversial issue, obviously, is that should one do a stoma or, or primary anastomosis? So what's your view, Jan, on this? Yeah, you, you, perhaps you, you could see me start smiling. <laughs> um, I tend to refrain from uh, constructing ostomies whenever it's possible. Um, we, we actually did two studies. One showed that uh, um, the construction of an ostomy, is, especially in the smaller children, um, is wrought with complications. And then you have to close the ostomy, which is another operation in itself. Um, but also, um, your developmental delay is more prominent in those children in whom we constructed an ostomy. And it, that sounds logical because you might think, well, those are the children who are probably the sickest. Um, but looking at all conventional parameters, that wasn't the case. And in our hospital, the uh, construction of an ostomy is rather consultant dependent. Uh, you've got consultants who tend to do an ostomy whatever, whenever, wherever, and you've got consultants like me who try to avoid the ostomy. So basically, I think the, um, the patients were quite similar in both groups. And then especially motor, uh, motor development was quite impaired in the ostomy patients when compared to the uh, primary anastomosis group. So unless uh, the randomized trial finally comes out um, showing that uh, we should uh, really do an ostomy or uh, a primary anastomosis, I would always have, uh, opt for a primary anastomosis, especially in the, in the smallest kids. What's on to your your view of this? Uh, well, we have very little uh, primary anastomosis in the, in the last, uh, say, let's say, uh, 15 years. And uh, I think that in the stoma, you can at least use the intestine, which is uh, proximal to the stoma. And, and that's also always a, a plus thing. But uh, I, a lot of it said about the complication of the stomas in these spaces, and, and that's true. But uh, even then, I don't think that these uh, complications in stoma are surgically very um, uh, difficult. However, whether the repeated operations or such things like that uh, affect the brain, uh, that's another thing. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm for the stomas for the time being. <laughs> Yeah, it's obviously it means that I'm on the same same team. And I, I think one thing which it's important to point out is that when we do a stoma, we always circulate the stoma secretion to the distal bowel. So the entire GI tract is in use as one would have a anastomosis. And I'm my sort of a personally I my thinking is that especially in in you know in sort of a proper neck situation, I would, like to, I would like to be entirely sure that there is no, you know, that event is dealt with. And in a way, by doing primary anastomosis in more or less uh, hostile environment, there is always a risk that the, the situation is not dealt 
And, and in worst than a case scenario, you end up with leakage and, and a whole lot of more problems, which can be even life-threatening in those babies. And I, I'm not sure whether that risk is worth taking. You know, I, I don't think we, any of us have a solid answer to that. No, <laughs> we don't. No. I, 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 we don't, and we, there is no uh, evidence of one or the other. We did a study that Agostino Piero uh, led here, and uh, it's completed, uh, but there were the, 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 the results are not out yet. Uh, my bias is towards doing an anastomosis if I can. Uh, but but I have to say, and I've had uh, many, uh, likely or unlikely, we see about 30, 35 babies with neck. We operate on 35 babies of neck a year. So we've got quite a big volume. And honestly, it works, but not for all of them. And so it's uh, rather than having a, a one fits all, it's very much, uh, you know, when we say precision medicine or precision child health, every neck is different. And every child uh, uh, might have a different length of bowel that is affected. If definitely, if it's a very uh, distal, I would not do it. I would absolutely divert, that's for sure. But if it's very proximal and it's a few, the last one I did was seven centimeters of necrotic bowel that I resected, I put together, the babies at home didn't need the further surgery and did very well. So, um, but again, it's one of these things that, that uh, uh, are operator dependent, but also very much patient dependent because it depends mm -hmm. on uh, neck is just uh, this umbrella term that we use uh, and it's so, um, it can come in so many different uh, forms and shapes. Yeah, and one one thing probably is that there's a lot of a difference what one calls isolated perforation and other one limited NEC. And, and of course, as you mentioned, the patients with very proximal Effective bowel, they are a sort of special group. And in those cases, we have naturally also done anastomosis and when you're sort of forced to do that. But so I can tell you the ones who are not the classical neck babies, so with the cardiogenic neck, a term babies with uh, heart failure, I tend to do a stoma because putting them together, I'm worried of ischemia. Again, it's just based on experience and um, uh, what my mentors uh, taught me in the past and not really on any evidence-based uh, paper. But yeah, this is, it, it's a, of course, a different story, a different category. Yeah. There's a question from uh, the group. Any suggestions uh, that gastric acid blockers uh, may provoke development of neck? Um, I don't know the literature about that, but one could imagine an effect on the good microbiota. Um, that might be the linking pin there, but that's purely speculative uh, for me, at least at this point. Okay. okay. I'm reading the questions. There's uh, Ronnie Fire who asks, uh, who says, hi, and thanks for these presentations. Uh, what the, does the panel think of the second look politics uh, in highly extended disease? Well, who wants to go first? <laughs> you go first. Yeah, I mean, of course, there are, I think there are those very, very uh, occasional patients where you might, might think, but even in those patients, you are in a situation where you do a resection, and then if the remaining bowel is, is very, very limited, then you sort of uh, want to leave something which gives hope that the patient eventually is able to come off PN. And, and at the same time, you need to hope that that sort of marginal bowel will recover. And we have done that very, very uh, selectively. And, and, and I think the main issue is that if you do that, you need to go back uh, quite early again to see how things are. And then there was a, uh, I think it was a few years ago in JPS in paper where they presented this kind of a damage control surgery in NEC where they sort of a, in a planned way uh, used a second look and sort of a, in a first operation just rapidly removed the uh, diseased bowel and, and clipped the ends of the remaining bowel and, and sort of a routinely uh, did a 
temporary closure and went back next day, their results were pretty good. But I think that if you do it for every patient, you, you will end up having the similar results, more or less whatever you do. But uh, I think there's a room for that. But like I said, those in, in my experience, it's very, very uh, occasional and, and selective patients, you might think that. Similarly here, I think um, to go back for a second look would imply that we would have an otherwise optimal patient with a dreadful bowel. Um, and that's a combination that's, uh, that you don't see too often. Um, so for also for us, uh, second looks uh, procedures are extremely rare and we certainly don't do it planned. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, the first thing is uh, often to save the patient's life uh, for keeps and not for the second opinion. The second look, sorry. Uh, another question, uh, it's very um, interesting. Anyone doing the Santulli neck? So when you're doing uh, your uh, stoma, um, do you do a specific type of stoma? Um, um, now we usually uh, do uh, say that is a small bowel ostomy. The uh, the ostomy comes out uh, right lower quadrant whenever possible, and we leave the mucous fistula uh, often in the wound whenever possible. Same here. Nanti. Yeah, we. Uh... We even put the both and uh, the ends of the stoma in the in the wound just to save the abdominal uh, period and uh, just contract the stoma that you can feed the efferent stoma with with feces yeah. properly and uh, yeah. Uh, whatever. yeah we haven't we haven't used Santuli for for many years but there was a period in Helsinki that it was used in. And you probably ought to have uh, details in your mind about the results of those, I'm not sure. Yeah, we had to do, uh, there was actually, there was 11 uh, of these patients and, and uh, we had to do uh, I, half of them again because they didn't uh, function as, as they, it, it was planned. And there was a problem with the, with the sample anastomosis which was uh, in the abdominal cavity in the patient, so we in in all quiet we we abandon this, uh, but it can, it may be work in a secondary um, procedure maybe, but uh, maybe not in an acute uh, situation. Yeah, and if I if I may add one thing is that it may have a place in those patients who develop severe dysmotility after severe NEC, uh, as we as Antti showed. Uh, also from Helsinki that there are several patients that uh, in addition of having a uh, severe short bowel syndrome, they have clearly developed very severe dysmotility. And after reconnecting of bowel continuity, uh, we're able, unable to increase the feeds as, as wished. And I think in, in some of those patients with uh, post-NEC, severe short bowel syndrome combined with severe dysmotility, those patients might be good candidates for, for a Bishop Cook or Santulli type of, of decompression, allowing also the impunity. Uh, uh, but those are very, very selective patients. Um, I think actually I can ask this question to Miko. Um, and this question, we can always recycle the content of the proximal stoma to the uh, distal stoma. Can you do always do that when you have a stoma? Basically, yes. I mean, we usually started uh, usually five, seven days after the operation once the stomas had uh, healed enough and usually started by surgeon, you know, the first insertion of catheter and and uh, it's, it's not usually a problem. Of course, there are sometimes a uh, little bit of a issues to get it started with, especially with the babies where the uh, distal stoma is very close to ileocecal valve, where the catheter might 
might sort of a stop in in the in the valve. But I, in the end of the day, I, I guess we have been able to recycle it in, in virtually every single patient. Okay. And and we do it as you know nurses do it. They, they begin a couple of three times a day and gradually increase it and. And the sort of goal is to to recycle everything. Question comes from uh, Spain, and it's about NIRS. Um, hold on a second. I just lost it. Um, so do you recommend routine NIRS on high-risk babies? If so, where do you place the NIRS detector? Um, we actually place, uh, well, the answer is yes. Um, we place two nearest detectors, uh, one uh, here, cerebral, and the other one, abdominal. Um, in the smallest kits, we're always struggling with the umbilical catheter, which has to be, uh, well, uh, put up uh, differently. Uh, we, we really try to put it on the intestine. That's not on the, uh, on the liver or, or on the kidney, which is also done. But we really try to measure the, the true intestinal, uh, we put it really on the middle of the abdomen. Okay, that's, uh, that's good. And then I think this can be the last question from uh, uh, Northern Ireland. So you mentioned the uh, Gamma GT, it was mentioned as an early indicator um, uh, that was being looked before neck uh, fully develops. Uh, why not ALT? I always notice that the ALT starts to increase as, as the bowel gets sad. Um, this is from Colette Donnelly from uh, Belfast. Yeah. Um, we never mention, we almost never measure ALT <laughs> routinely, um, especially not during uh, early phases, but I can imagine that there is something of a uh, good liver access uh, at work, which might also uh, increase uh, ALT, but uh, perhaps uh, Miko or Antti, you'd like to add to that? I tried to uh, measure that in, uh, and collect the measurement in, in uh, the patient, but however, there was uh, so few of the measurements that I couldn't make the uh, proper assessment. However, they, the, uh, I made a scattergram of the that uh, biomarker, and uh, it was uh, it, it didn't show me anything, but it was only from eleven patients. So probably it's not useful. Okay. Well, I think we can conclude. It was a fantastic uh, discussion, and uh, for uh, we always come out of this, uh, especially when we talk about necrotizing enterocolitis, with more questions than answers. Uh, everyone has their own perspectives, their own biases, uh, but it's it, for me this is fascinating. I always learn a lot, so I really thank you all for participating and giving us uh, your uh, your take on uh, on this uh, condition. Uh, we had people from, uh, a lot of people from, the, from Asia, from Kashmir, Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, uh, of course, from Europe, uh, from North America. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely um, uh, um, great to see that UPSA has definitely gone beyond the border of, U of Europe and is a leader in, uh, um, uh, as an association. Uh, for the treatment of these babies and kids with uh, surgical pathologies. Miko, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, I just want to thank, thank the speakers and, and, and all the good questions and also add that besides you saw Ernica too. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Hey, I'm, I'm in Canada, that's why and I'm really sorry about that. I was said it at the very beginning, this is a joint Yupsa and Ernica. Yeah. Meeting. You know, Ernica is a great uh, um, adventure, can I say that? Uh, that started not very long ago, and I'm only hearing uh, it's the, really definitely the way to go to answer these questions. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for, for participating, and thank you, Gaia, for making this uh, happen as usual. Okay. Next one. Thanks. Bye. 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 See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.